looking at the background, this is Jeroboam, and he's heard a word from Ahijah the prophet, and he was good enough to give him a word and was fine then, but later on, I often wonder in life, why people forget that it was God that spoke to a human being to give you a word, and they spend so much time trying to deceive the human being that they forget you can't deceive God. Yeah. Yeah. That the person that you're actually hiding from is God. Yeah. While you're ducking and dying, I don't want them to see me, they can't hug me, they can't touch me, they may pick up on me. How about God already picked up on you? Yeah. Yeah. When you lose the fear of God, that's a dangerous thing. When you become more people conscious than God conscious, that's a horrible thing. You have sentenced yourself to nothing but trouble. God is watching you. So we're starting here, first verse. At that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Okay, now here is the king and queen's son, Ahijah's the prophet. Abijah's the child. Mm -hmm. Their child gets sick. Mm -hmm. And the text, the historian said that it, they wouldn't say specifically what kind of sickness or disease, but it was so severe that his parents wondered whether he would live or die. Mm -hmm. And they wanted a word. Mm -hmm. This is powerful because I don't know about you. Anytime something crop up, your wonderful pastor is notorious about that. Your overseer is notorious about that. What are you saying, God? Five years ago, February 18th will be my five year mark. Five years ago, when my OBGYN said I had cancer, the very next thing I did when I walked out of my office is, what are you saying about that, God? Yeah. I need a prophet. Yeah. Let me see if I can reach Bob Jones. Let me see who else I can read. God, I need to know what you got to say about what they say that's going on in my body. Yeah. What are you saying about this illness? What are you saying about this sickness? What is your word on this? Yeah. The government should be, the president should be consulting the prophets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is our pattern, our example. That he's consulting the prophet because God wants to run the government. What are you saying about my child? Mm -hmm. They had physicians, not carrying the name physicians, but during that time, the royalty, you're talking about kings and queens, they had people that could work all kinds of uh, in the medical field, long before we used the term medical field, they had all of these different things that they could do. If last week, if you remember, Isaiah told uh, Hezekiah to put a poultice on it. He used figs. He used herbal remedies. They had certain things to try, but they all wanted to hear what did God say about it. And we should still be there today. God, what are you saying? The doctor doesn't have the final word. God has the final word. Okay. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise, I pray thee, and disguise thyself, that thou be not known to be the wife of Jeroboam. Pause there. Why would a husband tell his wife, Go and disguise yourself, so that the prophet doesn't even know you're my wife? Better yet, why would she swallow that? Ananias and Sapphire, one goes in and lie and tell the wife, Now you come in and say the same thing. And they carry him out dead and then carry her out next. There's a message to me in that. You, the two shall become one flesh, but you ought to have your own walk with God. And especially mothers, this is my child. Disguise what? That would have been my attitude. This is my child. You disguise. I'm going to find out. I want him to know it's me. I want him to know it's my child. So there is no mixed up word. I want it to be a clear, specific word. I don't want it to be a word because he thinks he's giving it to someone else. Right. Jesus. I need a word about my child. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. And get thee to Shiloh. Behold, there is Ahijah, the prophet, which told me that I should be king over this people. Okay. He remembered that he told him that he would be king. He still kept in contact with him because he was able to tell his wife he's in Shiloh. Now, he wasn't sending her to a rookie. Mm -hmm. He knew this man was precise and on point because what he prophesied to me about being king, I'm king. Yeah. So I know he can hear. Yeah. And take the ten loaves and cracknels and a cruise of honey and go to him, and he, he shall tell thee what shall become of this child. Okay. Go with a gift. Mm -hmm. Go take an offering. 
Now, to some, it seems so old-fashioned during this day and time. They'll come looking for a word, but, but consider it damnable heresy if you ask for an offering. Well, you shouldn't have to ask. Yeah. This man knew you need to take an offering and give an offering. And it should not be that there are gimmicks and tricks and games that, okay, if you come and you need a word, I'll give you a bottle of red oil. And then now you give an offering for the red oil. I'll give you a piece of cloth and then now you give an offering for that. It puts people in a position to do those type things. Not that God can't work through handkerchiefs because you worked that through a handkerchief from Peter's body and so forth. It's the mindset of people that want to hear from the Lord but not seeing that these are prophets and God reserved them for himself just like the Levites. He said, I don't want them to work. You're on your portion. Stay in the temple and then what comes to the temple will take care of you. So I'm talking about being biblically correct. Protocol. Yes. It should bring an offering. Amen. So this king understood protocol, though he was a king. He sent an offering. But Jer and Jeroboam's wife did so, and arose, and went to Shiloh, and came to the house of Ahijah. But Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were set by reason of his age. And the Lord said unto Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam cometh to ask okay. a thing of thee. When it says his eyes were set by reason of his age, he got no... Now they take cataracts off. He had gone blind. Right. So he could no longer see. But God didn't need his natural sight right. in order for him to see in the spirit, right? Amen. And the Lord said to Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam cometh to ask a thing of thee for her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus shalt thou say unto her, For it shall be when she cometh in that she shall feign herself to be another woman. Now, isn't that some tremendous detail? You can't see and God tells you exactly who's coming. He's telling you they're going to disguise themselves. He tells you the condition of the child. And he tells you exactly what to tell them. Yes. Go ahead. And it was so that when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet as she came in at the door, that he said, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam. Why feignest thou thyself to be another? For I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. Go tell Jeroboam, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, For as much as I exalted thee from among the people, and made thee prince over my people Israel, and rent the kingdom away from the house of David, and gave it to thee, and yet thou hast not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do only okay, which was now, right. Wow. He sends the son, the wife, to find out the condition of the son and will the son live. God goes further. You can't ask about your son, but let me tell you how you've been disobedient. Yes. Let me remind you what I told you to do and remind you what you have not done. When I did that, I saw a hand reach back to you, touch your forehead. He developed worship down on the inside of you from the time you were a little boy. Praise down on the inside of you from the time you were a little boy. That God would sing. Though you had tremendous athletic abilities, but God was singing through you, guiding you, governing you, and directing you so that you would have a generational Levitical priesthood that would run out of your loins. I see it coming out through the second four, like starting with you, then your son, your son's son, and your son's son, on down the line of uh, singing, glorifying, worshiping the Lord, bringing the presence of the Lord in the building. That's why the enemy is trying to bully you so many times and trying to stalk you. This is just the beginning of what God has already planted and fertilized many, many years ago. This is a new season, a new career, a new avenue, a new area that he's ushering you into. A planting of the Lord, planting you in the house of the Lord to fulfill your divine destiny, the spiritual calling that's on your life. Just as he made you successful uh, in the talents, in the spiritual side, God has greased you and anointed you so that you would be a carrier of that Davidic worship.
you ever come to God for one thing and He addressed something you didn't ask Him about? But has done evil above all that were before thee, for thou hast gone and made the other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger, and hast cast me behind thy back. Therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam. Okay, now what's wrong with this? He is doing the same thing that God told him not to do in his commission. He's doing the same thing that God replaced the previous king for. He's leading his people into the same sin that God told him when he was making him king that this is what I don't want you to do. And this is why I was through with the other king. What sense does it make the same thing that God punished somebody else over now you're doing the exact same thing? The same reason he got rid of them, now he's getting rid of you. Yes. And I will cut off Jeroboam, him that pisses against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. And I will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam, as a man taketh away dung, till it be all gone. Him that dieth of Jeroboam in the city shall the dogs eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat, for the Lord hath spoken it. Arise thou therefore, get thee to thine own house, and when thy feet enter into the city, the child shall die. And all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave, because in him there is found some good thing toward the Lord toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. Moreover, the Lord shall raise him up a king over Israel, who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam that day. But what even now? For the Lord shall smite Israel as a reed is shaken in the water, and he shall root up Israel out of his good land, which he gave to their fathers, and shall scatter them beyond the river, because he hath made their groves provoking the Lord to anger. And, it, and he shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, who did sin and made Israel to sin. And Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Tirzah. And when she came to the threshold of the door, the child died. And they buried him, and all Israel mourned for him according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by the hand of his servant Ahijah the prophet. Okay, so you see this example of God not only whips the leader, he whips the children too. But God of Israel, Israel is symbolic of the church. And I'm going to, therefore, not just you, mother and father, I'm getting rid of you as king because you led my people into sin. That's the responsibility of leadership. Your actions, your behavior made other people sin. And I put you in a position, now I'm going to take you out of it because you led other people into sin. And this child that you love and want to know the condition of this child, look at the irony. I, irony, I call the prophetic behind it. This child is a good child. He doesn't take the child because the child is bad. Right. He takes the child because he said, I found some good in the child. No good in the daddy, but good in the child. Amen. So I'm going to go ahead and take the child away from all these sinful people. While they're still in right standing. While it's good in them, I'm going to move them from around you before I lose him. What a dreadful burden that you lose your child because you're such a sinner. Jesus. That God didn't want them around you. Jesus. God didn't want them around your people that you taught to worship out of God. So you'll bring them home to him to protect them from you. Jesus. Yes, isn't that? It's now, imagine this grieving mother. It's, she's got to go back. 30 miles thinking about when my feet come into the city, not when I walk into my house, when I enter the city, my child's going to die. And the reason my child is dying is my husband didn't fulfill his mandate to do what God told him to do. He led the church astray, spiritual Israel. So now the church is in trouble, and he is too, as a result of our actions. She didn't blame God. She didn't go off on the prophet like some people would want to go off and have him killed. This king didn't send somebody to have him killed because he didn't like the word. 
Because this king also has had enough, and you'll see this on next week. As I go further into the series of the unknown prophets, you'll see where some people have gone off. Um, some kings had the nerve to try to go off on the prophet and how God handled that. So now it's when Saul grabbed Samuel's mantle and ripped it from him and prophecy. God used that same man to say, and the Lord has torn the kingdom from you. Don't put your hand on my stuff, said the Lord. Don't think you can grab an anointing that doesn't belong to you. So it released the prophecy of judgment. There are certain things, your attitude determines whether God will do further. That bad attitude of feeling like I'm entitled to do wrong and you need to go along with it. And make me look good in the eyes of the people. He delivered this word to King Jeroboam's wife and foretold the death of the son and destruction and dynasty and fall of Israel. Now, according to the rabbinic credits, Ahijah, with having lived a long life, in other words, the rabbinic credits are, are attributed Ahijah, this prophet, to living a long life and linking his lifespan, uh, lifespan with that of the antediluvian, uh, such as Methuselah and Adam. So it linked it up with Methuselah. Abba. He lived a long time, and I, it's important that you look at that. Prophet that lived a long time because he wasn't timid. He didn't water down the word. He would, didn't fail to deliver the word that God told him to deliver, regardless of who it was, their status, their position in life. So it adds to your life for those prophets that are listening. Jeroboam was the first king of the northern Israel, and his wife's name was, it didn't say it in that text, but the nosy me said, what is her name? So I spent hours researching. She's got to have a name. Anno, named only in the Septuagint as a Greek version of the Hebrew Bible. It was Queen Anno. This was a prophecy to a king and a queen, the earthly government, that God, through an earthly prophet, gave about a child. This is relevant to prophets speaking to our presidents today, to speak to the people in government. God cares about and chooses the kings and the government of the land. God still wants to lead our government. Yeah. God still wants to lead, speak to prophets. Unlike the prophet Isaiah, prophet Ahijah delivered heavy tidings, a heart-wrenching message to a mother about her child. A devastating message for a wife to take to her husband. God forbid that you got to go and tell your husband that your child is going to die. The interesting thing about this story is that her husband instructed her to disguise herself. This prophet is old and he's blind. And Elijah, as the wife comes and inquires, she pretends. I like the fact that God said to her, said to his prophet, she will disguise herself. It just says your natural sight does not play a part in God speaking. You can use your natural sight, but he doesn't need it, even blind or deaf. I love it that he said when he heard her feet, I immediately thought, how do you know that wasn't somebody else coming ahead of her? Into that heart and pulling it out and massaging that heart, doing a heart examination so that he's getting rid of all of the pain that could cause physical abnormalities and strengthening you so that you can develop your own relationship with him because he's bringing you to a place that you don't just know him as daddy of somebody else or God of someone else, but your person, inter intercessor, sitting on the right hand of the Father, and you're having a conversation with him like you would have with your friend, telling him what's going on, and trusting him that he hears you, especially seeing those crying days and crying nights, him looking at you, and when nobody else saw you weeping, and no one else saw you crying, he saw you, and when he saw you, he dried away your tears. When you felt like all alone and nobody knows what I'm going through, there was an invisible presence with your angelic host that God released that they would love upon you, hug upon you to see you through. When you cried until you had no more strength and when you gathered yourself and came out of the bedroom and came out of back closed doors and came out of the bathroom, you came out with another face. They didn't see where you really were, but God wanted you to know that he saw you. The Savior of your soul saw you. And it's changing some things so that there will be more times of joy than times of sorrow. And the times of understanding 
where you've been totally misunderstood, great understanding coming, where you felt like this weirdo and this eyeball of you feeling like I fit somewhere, an extreme loneliness that's been on you and over you, more than just her. Jump up too, there's some people in the room that have felt so lonely, jump to your feet, this is a blanket prayer. You felt so lonely and felt so by yourself that you felt like, Lord, I'm just not, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this. Put your arms around her, Nikki. I don't know how I'm going to make it through this. God, only you can help me. I don't know how much more of this loneliness I can take. God promised to bring evil upon the royal line. That wrongdoing didn't affect just one person. What you're doing wrong doesn't affect just one person. It could affect generations. If we would think generationally, I think it would alter our behavior. If we think about, what am I doing to my child? Or my great-great-grandchildren. God promised to cut off every male. So we're looking at heads of households now. Those that could produce children, not just ones that carry it. But he was going to put, going after the sperm donor. Yeah. Every male, I'll cut them off and sweep them away as if it's feces, a BM. Mm -hmm. Adult poop. He said, I'm going to cut them off and sweep them away. <laughs> Jeroboam, and sweep them away if it's just feces. Dogs will eat dead male body descendants that die in the city. What a dreadful sentence. You want the, every male out of your lineage, out of the royal line that died in the city, dogs will eat them. Mm -hmm. Now your child will be the only one that actually sees the grave. The rest of them, they can't find a body to bury. Get it? Mm -hmm. If that isn't the God of judgment, you say, God, don't upset God. Look at your neighbor and say, don't upset God. Don't upset God. Birds. Admitted I grew up where there were buzzards in the road. Birds, buzzards eating dead bodies of anyone that dies in the field. Everybody that died in the city, the dogs will eat. If they die in the field, the birds will eat. The buzzards will eat. So every time you saw a buzzard eating someone in that royal bloodline, you had to remember God said he was going to cut off every male, but he's still man. They're dead, and now he's having the dogs eat them and the buzzards eat them. He doesn't want their bones to go in the ground. Abijah, he alone of Jeroboam's, and this is Abijah, not Ahijah, the little boy. He alone of Jeroboam's family will come to the place in the grave. Because in him there was found something good and pleasing to the Lord. God was pleased with the child. That's a slap in the face. The mom and daddy, I'm not pleased with you, but I'm pleased with your child. So you can't say you necessarily did a great job. You just basically let me remove this child out of your care before you ruin them. Yeah. At the time, Ahijah the son, who was a crown prince and heir to Jeroboam, became sick. And his father said his wife, it wouldn't say what type of sickness that he had, but the wife had to walk 20 miles to Shiloh. And walking those 20 miles, the king sends his wife to the prophet to ask if the child will live. Now you're concerned about the livelihood of your child, but you're not concerned about obeying God. Jesus. Jesus. You're concerned about whether your child will live, but you're not concerned about being honest with God. Or honest with his prophet. You care enough to give a gift, but you don't care enough to not lie. Or be deceptive. To pretend you're somebody that you're not. Involves trickery. So Ahijah is a prophet that we should keep etched in our memory banks. In that when you're in your 90s, God forbid, or hundreds. And you may feel like I'm losing my hearing and losing my sight. You're still not losing God. You're still not losing the power of the Holy Spirit. You're still not losing the gifts. God still can flow through you. God can still use you. You can still carry the anointing. But you have to care enough to be conscious of more conscious of God than you are of man. Amen. 
Thank you for watching on Facebook Live. God, I thank you for every person that watches and for every person that's here in this service. Let the fear of God rest on them and let it rest on them more heavily than the fear of man. Let them be more concerned about being real and transparent with those prophets that have spoken into their lives, with those pastors, evangelists, apostles, and teachers that have the oversight. And Lord, let the government of God in the earth realm be more conscious of being role models, being letters and that can be read of men, that people can read our lives and love you and know you and follow you, that their lives will not be into self-worship, will not lead into horoscope worship, that will not lead into worshiping inanimate objects, but they'll be spirit-led in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Thank you for watching. Don't forget, hit that donate button. We appreciate you giving in your fund. Those that are in the room, thank you for being a part of this service. God wants you. Amen. You heard that saying, Uncle Sam was looking for a few good men. God is looking for men and women that will serve him. Yes. That will surrender their life to him. Yes. That will understand the reason God put the sent prophets and put them in your life to guide you. Prophets guide. Apostles govern. Yes. Guiding. Governing. So you look at that trigger, the hammer. So God wants to guide and instruct your life. And he's looking for individuals that will obey. That you remember what he said and fear him more than man. Amen. 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 Oh, daughter, she's just been faithful to hear. She's been listening and listening and listening. God, I thank you for being listening in the night season and even during the day. Now, her words that she's written down in journal, she's going to share more and more of them. Where they've been in journals and they've had dates next to them. But, Lord, I thank you that it's a season that she's going to begin to expose it and serve it up. Instead of taking the back seat, Lord, I thank you that she's going to come to the forefront. And instead of dumbing down and letting others feel that they have the greater knowledge, she's going to begin to pull out all of the things that you've been sharing with her that's been right on point because there have been people in her life, Lord, she thought that they were in her life to help her but Lord, you really had her to help them yeah. to change their thinking yeah. in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.